Hey guys, this is Studybug here again. This is part two of AP Human Geography Review for Agricultural, Urban, and Economic and Political. First part is agriculture. So there are two types of agriculture. There's intensive agriculture, which requires a lot of labor and small land space. And then there's extensive agriculture, which is limited labor and lots of land. The first agriculture we Revolution is a Neolithic revolution. It started 10,000 years ago. It's when we had a hunter and gatherer society, and then we shifted towards agriculture societies. And there's the second agriculture revolution during the Industrial Revolution around 1750 in Europe, and we used machines to increase food production and support in industrial centers. Third agriculture revolution is known as the Green Revolution. It began after World War II and spread a modern Western machines, farming methods, and scientific development. The fourth agriculture revolution is organic revolution, which happened in the early 2000s when going concerned over GMOs, genetically modified organisms, led many individuals and states to transition to natural organic food. So there are many types of agriculture. Pastoral nomadism is a form of subsistence-based agriculture. And so what subsistence means is you're only doing it for your own family, for your own or own community, and not like large-scale farming. It's like, so pastoral nomadism is basically when you're grazing, it's mostly occurs in developing countries with dry climates. And there's shifting cultivation, which is a form of agriculture where people shift activity from one field to another. And then there's a trench when each field they burn, they leave alone, and then they leave alone. And this is found in developing country. It's, and then there's trench movements, which is seasonal migration. Another type of agriculture is intensive subsistence. It's a form of agriculture where farmers work intensively to subsist on a parcel of land. Then there's plantation farming, which is a commercial farming specializing one and two crops for major sales. And then there's mixed crop and livestock, which is the integration of crops and livestock. So the crops feed the animals, and then the animals meat is used for this sale. Next is deer farming, which deals with cows and basically milk and cheese. Then there's commercial gardening, it's fruit farming. So Example, this is truck farming, which sells fruits and vegetables. Then there's livestock ranching, which is commercial grazing on semi-arid or dry land. Then there's subsistence agriculture, which is a form of agriculture where, as I said before, is for the farmer's family and that's for developing countries. Then there's commercial agriculture, which is a form of agriculture grown for the sale of the farm, the opposite of subsistence. And the last two is grain farming, which Crops are grown primarily for human consumption in this Mediterranean, which borders the sea for like olive, grapes, and cereal. Be free, you're free to pause the video anytime if you want to look and read the words. The next thing you should know is von Neumann's model. So what his model was, it explains the connection of different agriculture practices in the market. So one is, so the Really, dot in the middle is a central city. Going outwards is the market gardening, gardening and dairying. The reason why it's close to the city is because those items perish quickly. Two is the forest. Three is extensive field crops and grains. And four is ranching and livestock. The reason why ranching and livestock is all the way at the edge is because these can transport, like the animals can transport themselves to the central city. Next topic is urbanization. So these are the different urban models. So the first one is the concentric zone. So based off that the CBD is the central of the city and values and rents increase, the distance increase. Then there's a gravity model, which means that the interaction between urban centers can be calculated by size and distance. Decreasing interactions in size and distance increases. Next is the multiple nuclei model, which accounts for the growing importance of cars and commuting. So the, the different sectors within the city and they support each other. 
At below that is the urbanization for reform model, where urban cities consisting of an inner city surrounded by large suburban residential and businesses areas tied together by beltway or ring road. Next up is the Hoyt sector model. So different areas, different activities are, are by chance of environmental factors. So as you can see, these wedge out. Then there's the central place theory, which explains the relationships between the location of businesses in relation to the population centers. So it basically means that people will travel less distance for essential goods, but will travel further for consumer goods. That goes into the topic of threshold and range. Range is how far a consumer is willing to travel for a good. The threshold is how much people it requires for the good to be produced. You should also know the galactic city model, which is the design based on urban sprawl. So that's when there's a city in the center, but then there's, there's suburbs like surrounding, around, surrounding the CBD. An example, this would be Phoenix, Arizona. So the sprawl allows many services to locate on the edge of settlements, and low-income residents live near industrial areas and highways. Any point or place in the urban hierarchy that has a certain economic reach or hinterland. So the, the center focus of the goods and service produced for the hinterland and its dominant urban influence as well. Next, you should know urbanization for the primate city rule. So that means the largest city is more than twice as large as the next city in terms of importance and population. Then there's rank size rule where you have the largest city and then half the number of that in rank one, then one third, then rank one, then one fourth of the rank one, and then one fifth of rank one. This is really pre prevalent in the United States. These are terms to know regarding urbanization and industrialization. Acclimation is the same types of businesses in the same type of location. Brownfields are previously developed land no longer in use due to deindustrialization. Example of this would probably, there are a lot of brownfields in the Rust Belt, which is in the Midwestern United States. The reason why those places are deindustrializing is because of offshoring and outsourcing because country, which is when country, when companies move to countries with lower wages and less economic regulations so that they can make more of a profit. Then there's gentrification, which is renovating deteriorated urban neighborhoods so that more affluent residents would come. Then there's block busing, which you encourage a certain uh, race to sell their homes at a lower price saying that when a new race moves in, prices will decrease. This is illegal. And then there's ethnic enclaves, which is a geographic area with high ethnic concentration, characteristic cultural identity and economic activity. An example of this would be Chinatown. The next topic is economic terms. So, so one of the economic terms you should know is growth national income, which is some of the values added up by the resident producers plus any product taxes, and there's gross domestic product, which is the sum of the market values of prices of all final goods and services. Then there's a gender development index, which measures the difference between male and female achievements and the basic dimension of human development. Then there's a human development index, which is a statistic of life expectancy, education, and per capita income. Then there's outsourcing, which as I said before, is the moving of goods and services to overseas due to lower costs. So these are the different types of se service sectors. This primary, which is when natural resources produce raw materials. Secondary, which processes the raw materials. Continuary, which is information-based store, store services. Quinary, which is household services. Territory, which is distributes the goods and provides services. These are the two different developments there's raw style stages of development where a country is traditional, agricultural, then a preconditions to take off, take off maturity and high mass consumption. Then the Wallerstein, which theorizes the world as a unified economic system 
in which countries have different roles depending on each other. Core countries, semi periphery countries, and periphery countries. What Wallerstein basically says is that the core countries are the rich countries, take advantage of the semi periphery and periphery countries, and that the countries can't really move up. And there's criticisms of both theories. For the Rosso's levels of development, people say that it's too simple and that it follows the Western capitalistic model, and that's not necessarily the only way. And then it also doesn't keep in mind that all countries started the same way or would want the same things as the U.S., so countries might have different wants and needs. Criticism of the Wallerstein's model is that it's very anti-capitalist and focuses more on communism. The next topic is transportation. Mainly there's a difference in cost of transportation for UC Santa Waterway, which it is going to replace the major waterway. Iron Horse. So that's the impact of steam, engine technology, sailboats, and railroad networks. This is steel rail, which is a development of long rail long haul railroads and national railroad networks. There's auto air amenity, so the growing rate of gasoline combustion engines. Then there's high technology epochs, which is expansion and service and information sectors of the economy. This is another topic called the location theory. So what it basically means is that weight losing industries, which is a large amount of input, for a product that weighs less would be located close to the resources. Example would be the steel and copper industries. While weight gaining industry, which means numerous inputs to make a final product that weighs more, would be close to the market. Example would be soda bottling. You also need to know these two terms at the bottom. The commodity chains refers to economic activities involving the creation of the good, and supply chain is the processes involved in distribution distribution over the good. This is another theory called the, one of the theories called the mckinder Heartland theory, which means, and what he said is you basically have to control the heartland in order to control the world. Then there's the Rimland theory, which means you have to control these maritime activities in order to control the main, have the main control. And another theory you should know is the organic theory, which basically means, and a state or a nation is like an organism and it needs to keep growing in order to survive. So these are another uh, political terms that you need to know. The law of the sea, which is this, what this picture is, and it shows basically where countries have sovereignty over. And speaking of countries, with a definition of that is identify land area. A state is a population under a single government. A nation is a population with a single single culture. A nation state is a single culture under a single government. A stateless nation is a nation without a state. And imperialism is a policy extending a country's power and influence through diplomacy and or military force. There are different forces that bring a nation together or apart. What brings a nation together is what's called a centripetal force. What brings them apart is called or breaks them apart is called the centrifugal force. Ethnic conflict, social injustice, poverty, or all centrifugal forces. Well, centripetal forces would be religious acceptance, common heritage, common language, patriotism, ethnic unity, and tolerance. Centrifugal forces can cause devolution. It's so when a state, or an, oh, I mean, balkanization, which is when a state breaks down through conflicts among its ethnicities. Then devolution is when regions within a state gain a political strength and growing autonomy at the expense of central government. Moving on, we need, you need to know the types of boundaries. The physical boundaries, which are natural based on natural features. Cultural boundaries, which is formed by cultural features. Geometric boundaries, formed by la longitude and latitude lines antecedent boundaries, which is boundaries made before an area is settled by humans. Subsequent boundaries are boundaries formed with the development of culture, 
superimpose its boundaries formed that ignore the cultural the ignore the cultural composition of the area and then there's relic boundaries which are boundaries that do not exist anymore wrapping up is supranational organizations a supranational organization is a type of multinational union between different states one of them is nafta which is the north american free trade agreement and that's signed by signed by canada mexico and the u.s to create a trade block in north america then there's european union which is a collect collection of political and economic union of 28 member states located primarily in europe within the eu it's very easy to travel and they have the same type of currency which is an intergovernmental organization tasked to maintain international peace, security, develop friendly relationships about nations, achieve international cooperation, and harmonize the actions of nations. So we reached the end of our video. Hope you watched both parts and you were able to review with me. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe for more videos like this. I hope you all do really good on your AP Human exam. Good luck and happy studying. Bye.